Hello. Welcome to post-colonial space. I hope you all are doing well and everything is going well in your lives. Today's topic is pretty simple. We'll be talking about Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart. Uh, part of the reason I chose it is because I just recently taught it and my thoughts on the novel are pretty fresh. So I thought I should share those with you, but also to see if you have any questions or anything, you know, that I can further amplify and clarify. Now, please keep in mind that there is a whole playlist on the channel on Things Fall Apart, which does a chapter by chapter discussion of the novel. And I placed it there so that you can use it as you read the novel for yourself. But also, if you're teaching the novel, and this is one of the most highly taught novels, uh, you can use those videos, of course, as a resource. And this webinar, of course, will also become part of it. So that was the general idea. I am hoping that you are all familiar with the novel. Of course, it is one of the most highly taught novel and you know, people include it in pretty much all literature classes. And maybe that is why I find it important to talk about it. So that's the topic today, things fall apart. And I will briefly give my own thoughts about the novel and then of course address your questions. A brief note about uh, today's video. It might like, look slightly shimmery to you because I'm using a virtual background. This is my first time using it and sometimes it causes a little bit of a problem, but I hope it's not too jarring an experience for you. So let me say hi, Beneath is here, welcome. And yeah, please uh, do say hi as you come in. And then of course, I'll talk to you a little more and welcome you to the today's session. Now, before I go into it, uh, please do note, I had just, I think yesterday I announced it also uh, through one of my videos that I do have now uh, a smaller, newer channel which is primarily just focused on books. And it is called Raja Reads. And what my hope is, is to add to this pretty much just brief summaries of different books that I like or books that are important, but mostly books from the post-colonial world. And you can see it, you can visit it. Um, but that's the purpose in that channel. And I would love, you know, your support there as well. So let me see, let me welcome Abdullah Khan, Adila Khan, um, Enrique, I, I can't pronounce, uh, Garoio, uh, Sahar, Mr. T. Blue, and welcome you all. And uh, Adila, to answer your question kindly, hold a webinar on God of Small Things. Yes, absolutely, we can do that. Maybe the next one I plan will be on God of Small Things. So yeah, certainly I can do that. Hello, Hamza, welcome. So good, quite a few of you are here. And uh, Oroko, welcome back. So uh, as I was talking about, you know, I would love to have your support on the Raja Reads channel, which is, all about books and methods of reading. So please do check it out. And uh, Venkata, welcome. Uh, and uh, cool, okay. So uh, uh, I will briefly give you my views of the novel. Okay, so you don't probably don't need the basic information, right? Chenwa Achebe is a big name in African literature. He is traditionally called the grandfather of African literary studies and probably the most prominent African writer, okay? Originally from Nigeria, right? But 
also keep in mind that he wasn't just a writer. He was also, he had opinions, both schol scholarly and political opinions about African writing, and especially about African writing in English. So if you're familiar with the debates of African studies in literature, there are two major camps and they came together back in the 80s. There was an African literature conference in which these two opposing groups developed, now opposing philosophically, of course, they didn't hate each other. And one group was led by Chinua Chibe and Flora Nawapa and these people who genuinely believed that English in a way and these are uh, Chebe's own words, was a gift left by the colonizers and it was okay for the African writers to write in it. And the opposing group were like people like Chin Wei Zhu, Ngugi Tiango and others. Their point of view was that yes, we write in English, but we also need to produce literature in regional African languages. And their argument was that because we write in English, we have enriched, and that's Sungugi Tiango, we have enriched the English language with our raw materials, with our stories, with our myths, with our proverbs. Why don't we take English knowledge and then write in Yoruba, write in Gikuyu, write in Kaswali, so that our people get to read their stories in their own language. So these are the two uh, opposing groups in African literary studies. These debates still you know, go on. So Achebe belonged to the group that believed strongly that you know English is good enough and it should be used by African writers to tell their stories. And uh, this novel then is a great example of that, of an African writer writing a quintessentially African story specific to Igbo culture, right? Not Africa, you know, Africa is a whole continent. But there's one distinction I always ask my students to make, and that is that despite its subject matter, its setting, its characters, right, its language, which is infused with Igbo proverbs, mythologies, histories, this is a quintessentially Western novel in terms of form, formalistically, right? And what do, you, what do I mean by that? That the novelistic form, we already know, you know, if you have read your Ian Watt, came to be in the late 19th, mid 19th, 20th century, and it developed in, developed in Europe. So if you're trained in the Western Academy, there are certain things you expect of a novel. A novel, you know, is usually either character driven or plot driven, right? If it is character driven, it will usually have one or two strong characters, right? A novel would have a habitus, a setting, cultural, temporal, spatial. But most of the times when you read a Western novel, especially modern or even realist novels, you are concerned with the life and actions of the main character. May it be a prota protagonist, the narrator, or just a main character in the story. That's what you expect from a Western novel. You expect that kind of a structure in a realistic novel, at least. Now think of things fall apart, you know, it meets all those requirements of what the Europeans might consider a proper novel. Okay, so I'm gonna pause a little because I have to hit the light. It goes off after 15 minutes and I'll come back. Sorry, technology, all right. Sorry. <laughs> technology. That is the problem with using these backdrops. Okay, uh, so if you look at the beginning of the novel, the first sentences, that is, Okonoko was well known throughout the nine villages and even beyond. His fame rested on solid personal achievements 
As a young man of 18, he had brought honor to his village by throwing Amalinze, the cat. Amalinze was the great wrestler who for seven years was unbeaten from Amofia to Mabino. He was called the cat because his back would never touch the earth. It was this man that Okonoko threw in a fight, which the old man, men agreed was one of the fiercest since the founder of their town engaged a spirit of the wild for seven days and seven nights. So think about the amazing mixture in this paragraph. We know this is the story of Okonoko. It starts with introducing the main character. But it's not Okonoko as a composite figure, Okonoko as, as part of a larger culture that determines him. That will come later. But we are told immediately at the beginning that this is the story of an individual. Now, that is a very formalistically speaking Western mode of writing, right? That's why I call that it's quintessentially formalistically a Western novel. And maybe that was the reason it was so successful other than the other cultural richness and everything else in it. Now, it's about one person and he is a self-made man that is emphasized in the very first paragraph, right? But it is further enriched with allusions to the local mythology, right? And that local mythology is that the fight was almost as fierce as the one people talk about as our ancestors fought a spirit, right, or a god. Now, if you were in the Christian tradition, it would be Jacob wrestling the angel, right? So these two things combining or an elusive nature of the novel in the first paragraph, but allusions are to non-Western tradition. But the character that he's developing is an individual, right? And that's what, in my opinion, makes the novel a fascinating read and a successful novel besides other things. Now, as you read the novel, there is never a doubt in our mind that throughout the novel, we get to know Okonoko. We also either sympathize with him or are perplexed at what he does. And then as the novel ends in that climactic ending, right, we feel sad for him too. And, and so that's the ultimate success of the novel itself for, for Achebe. Another important thing to keep in mind, right? And this would be very interesting to my Pakistani friends here because, you know, a lot of my Pakistani students and friends, they are always worried about how their country is represented and all that. I think it part of it comes from a sort of a national anxiety that we have never really resolved, is that Achebe doesn't give us the magical black man. No, he doesn't give us a perfect native character. He gives us a flawed character, a character whom sometimes we absolutely do not like. And if we did a thin reading of it, more people could go around and say, oh, he has done a disservice to Africa, right? But no, think of it. Achebe is famous for indicting Conrad in Heart of Darkness for only including the African characters as mere presences. They have no story. We never learn anything about their culture. They are just passive recipients of European violence, right? They have no voice. So what he sets to do in the novel then is give us a living, breathing character and a culture. And within that gives us a human being with huge flaws, right? And that is what makes it compelling that he's not saying, I'm going to give you a nativist narrative of all these good Africans. No, I'm going to give you a story of a living, vibrant culture, 
within that the story of one man, his rise and his fall, just like we expect in a Western novel, right? But in the process of doing so, I'm going to educate you about the Igbo culture, what were their customs, right? How did they live their lives? How did Okonako come to be who he is? What are his personal struggles, right? And towards the end, how does colonialism come in? How does Christianity come in? How does it make inroads into the native culture, right? And how does then it confront the native culture and what happens to the people in the process, right? So it's a post-colonial novel in that sense. It deals with issues of coloniality, but only on the fringe, right? But tells the story of an individual, right? From the Igbo land, but from a small area which has 10 villages, right? And that's what, uh, what makes it, you know, a complex, but a really good novel. So Abdullah Khan, what do you mean by novelistic form? Uh, so, I mean, that's a very complicated question. By form, I mean how we define a novel. So just like if you think of poetry, a narrative poem has certain definitions, a lyrical poem has certain definitions. Similarly, the novelistic form of writing, people have theorized about it, People who teach the craft will teach you how to write a novel, what it must have, what, what kind of character development. That is the novelistic form, the, the way of storytelling which the novel incorporates. A good explanation, and there are several. Lukács has a book on it. E.M. Forrester has a book on it. But by far, the most comprehensive book on the novelistic form uh, is Ian e. Watts' The Rise of the Novel. If you are serious literature scholars, I highly recommend it. So good question. OK, so going back to the novel, I'll just talk about Achebe's technique, right? And I just discussed it with my students a few weeks ago, is that, OK, so the novel has three parts. The first part is the longest, right? And in the first part, we learn about the individual aspects of Okonako's life, right? How does he live? But we also learn about the ritualistic aspect of the culture in which he lives. What is the belief system, right? What are the rituals of birth, marriage, right? Death. And what are the rituals of justice? And if you notice towards the end of part one, three chapters, I think 12, 11, 12, and 13. One is about the ritual of marriage proposal. One is about the ritual of justice. How is justice served? And one is about the rituals of death, right? So interspersed in Okonako's stories is this cultural knowledge, right? And the way Achebe weaves that into the storytelling is because Okonoko is part of all the experiences. But in the process of reading about ex his experiences, we are also learning about Igbo culture, at least in these 10 villages, right? What do they believe in? How is a marriage proposal sent? If you look at the trial where the spirits of the ancestors come out, of course, those are men, right? honorable men of the tribe dressed as the spirits of the ancestors, right? But they come out, right, and they mediate. They mediate a case. And it might seem odd to us, but think about those of you who are in colonial justice systems. How do the judges dress? Isn't it a performance, the wigs, the robes, right? So their performance doesn't come across as odd to us. So by the time we finish part one, we haven't just learned about Okonoko. We know that he's driven by fear, right? Fear of becoming like his father. He's afraid of being weak. I have to do this again. Sorry, bad choice this today to use this screen. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> so, so he's driven by the fear that he would somehow become like his father. His father was a musician, right? But he wasn't a successful man in the culture. 
And Aquanico has kind of defined his life in opposition to him. And it's that fear that drives him. And that fear that also kind of encourages him to perform a very destructive form of masculinity, right? Which has consequences. So by the end of part one, he has done about two transgressive things, right? And the third one is one that gets him evicted, right? So the first transgressive thing he, that he does is he beats his wife during the time of peace before the planting of the crops. And that is an absolute no-no in a culture where you believe that gods and ancestors intercede on your behalf and your action can imperil the lives of everyone. Because if the goddess of land is mad at, at the village, everyone will suffer. The second action is when he kills his adopted son, which he was not required to do, right? And the third is when he accidentally kills a local youth, right, in a, ce in a celebration of death right? One of the elders who had passed away. And that is when he is expelled from his village, right? And he leaves for seven years to go and live in his mother's village from where his mother had come from. And the second part is Okonako's life amongst the people of his mother, right? Okay, Oroko. Most often we read Okonoko the same way we read the Greek. Absolutely. Yeah, because the thing is, and you are right, Oroko, the, you know, the Greek tragic characters sometimes loved by gods are abandoned by them. And I think Achebe, that's why Achebe writes Okonoko like that, right? He's giving us a hero in so many ways larger than life. But this hero is constructed and underwritten by not the Hellenistic tradition or the Western tradition, but an African tradition, an Igbo tradition, right? And so by the time we finish reading a novel, we have read the story of a tragic hero from the Igbo land, from Africa, right? And if you look at the structuring of his self, none of it is determined by any influence of the West. That is an integral part of the culture in which he lives, part of which he adopts or aspires to, and part of which he defies in so many ways. So absolutely, it would be great not to read him as a Greek tragic hero, but as an African tragic hero. OK, Hamza, I have a research project about this novel. What is issue in this novel, and what theory can I use to analyze? I mean by theory like Fanon, Edward Said, well, that's a really interesting question. I have no answer to that. I don't answer questions like that because uh, these require very simplistic answers. You know, I could spew out 10 theories and two points in the novel that you can write about. I think the better, and I have videos on how to conduct a research project, the only way you will know about what you can write about Right? And it also depends on the level at which you're writing. Is it a graduate paper? It is an undergraduate paper. But the only way you will know what to write about is to read up on post-colonial studies. Right? What are the major themes and thematics that people discuss? Then look up the resources on the novel, on any of the databases in your library. Right? That will give you an idea of what has been published about the novel. This is the most published about African novel. So chances are whatever you are thinking to write about and you think is original has already been done. So there is nothing wrong with that. Then you go back and see where you enter the conversation. And that's the only way you will know what to write about, about things fall apart, is do your research find out what has been written, and where do you enter that conversation, right? OK, so London base. Yes, that is a, uh, th that book is amazing. Good. Oroko, 
Oroko, in my community, elders still medi mediate conflicts. Yes, and any living community for that matter, not just uh, in Kenya and Nigeria. You go to my village, there are so many things that are not brought to the courts because you know people go to the village elders or those who are of influence in a village and they bring their grievances. And so many times, you know, they sit together and they say, okay, you do this, you do this, let's mediate. And it's still done. Um, okay, so Mr. T. Blue, do you think this book creates a good opportunity to discuss post-colonialism versus decolonization, both its current discourses and its historical moment in Africa? Uh, yes, this and many other books. And that's where we are going because as you always, uh, those of you who attend my sessions frequently, you know that by post-colonialism, we don't mean that colonialism has ended. It continues in different forms. Uh, but it's a good example of a post-colonial novel because it does two things. It gives us insights into the living culture of one particular group in Igbo land and tells us how people lived their lives pre-colonialism and how does this one man Okonoko rise in that culture? What is expected of him, but what does he expect of him? It teaches us that. Two, in part two of the novel, he is with his mother's people. He has been exiled for seven years and that is when things start changing, right? Missionaries come in they start converting people, right? That is the encroachment of Western Christianity into Africa, into the heartland of Igbo land, right? But who do they convert, right? All transformative religions, whenever they go into a new place, they take it upon themselves to convert those who are already excluded from the dominant culture in which they live, right? So they convert, you know, women who, who have, having twins and have to abandon their twins. They convert people who were considered outsiders, right? And so they have a toehold. But what they also learn as Obraika, Okonoko's friend, when he comes to visit and tells him that one whole village had been wiped out by the Europeans because they had killed the missionary. What they have learned is that behind this church is a mighty force, right, to back it up. And what that teaches us in post-colonial studies is also how the actions of the church, sincere as they might have been, were also an opening into any given culture. And sometimes they provided the reason for the military to intervene, right? So a new structure is emerging. That's why things fall apart at the end, right? Okonoko is slowly becoming aware of it, that this religion brought by the white man or the Europeans is taking away their youth, right? Okonoko is still caught in going back to his village and reclaiming his honors and initiating his sons, right? He's still in that old mindset. So section three is the final part of the novel where he returns to his family, his old compound, but things have changed. In his own village, there is a Christian church now. There are government officials appointed by the British. They are the ones who mete out justice. They have messengers, right, who bring the message of the new empire to the people. People are not fighting back, right? Okonoko is a warrior. He exhorts people to fight back, but no one is willing to fight back, right? So suddenly, the very culture that he had planned to return to for seven years in which he was going to rise to be a top man has slipped away. It no longer exists. So when that doesn't exist, Okonoko, who had invested so much in rising in his own culture, in his own villages, he has nowhere else to go. He's a man of war. He's a warrior, right? So when they get arrested, remember, and they are beaten by these messengers. Who were these messengers? So what the British would do, I'm sorry about this, I, I will 
do something about this light situation. I apologize. Okay, so, so who are these messengers? So what the British would do is whenever they went into any African territory, uh, they will uh, hire local soldiers and local messengers from other tribes, sometimes from tribes that were hostile to the tribe where they were sending their administrators. So these people came in, even though they were African, they didn't understand Igbo culture, right? They didn't respect it. So that's one group that is going against the local customs, right? And intervening in it, and they have the power of the British magistrate or the British functionary behind them. The other group who is doing that is the increasingly increasing number of the Christian converts. These are the two pressures, let's say, on Okonoko's village, but it's happening at a large scale, right? So when Okonoko and other elders, these are prominent men in their tribe, get arrested and get mistreated by these overseers and messengers, right? They, they feel shamed, right? But the Okonoko also feels shame that when they come out of that prison after they pay the fine, is that even when they meet, they have a gathering, people decide not to fight against it, right? against the British, against the Europeans. And that is when Okonoko does what he knows will bring upon destruction on his people. He kills the messenger, right? Now, the only way he can save his own people is by either surrendering himself, which he is not going to do. So he does the most unthinkable thing. He hangs himself, which is the biggest taboo you can do, right? It is so bad within the tribal custom that his own people cannot touch him, cannot bury him, right? So the tragic end then is that the very culture within which Okonko had determined to be a certain kind of man, right? A flawed masculinity, destructive. He has no access to it in his death, right? But the most instructive part of the novel for me, which makes it a fascinating post-colonial reading, is the last few paragraphs. They are not about Okonko. They are about the British magistrate, right? Who allows his messengers to cut Okonoko down and bury him so that the town people don't have to do it. It's his comment, right? And I'm going to read it. The commissioner went away, taking three or four of the soldiers with him. In the many years in which he had toiled to bring civilization to different parts of Africa, he had learned a number of things. One of them was that a district commissioner must never attend to such undignified details as cutting a hangman from the tree. Such attention, I mean, of course, that's ironic, right? Such attention would give the natives a poor opinion of him. It's ironic, but that's what the British believed, right? Keep their distance from the natives. As he walked back to the court, he thought about the book. Every day brought him some new material. The story of this man who had killed a messenger and hanged himself would make interesting reading. One could almost write a whole chapter on him, perhaps not a whole chapter, but a reasonable paragraph. At any rate, there was so much else to include and one must be firm in cutting out details. He had already chosen the title of the book after much thought, the pacification of the primitive tribes of the lower nature. Okay. Think of it, at the last moment in the novel, after Okonoko has died, we are in the mind of the magistrate, the commissioner. We have just read a, a full novel which tells us the rich story of Okonoko's life and the life of his tribe with conflicts and hopes. And so we know Okonoko, but to that British, official. He's just a paragraph. He doesn't know the complexity of the life of Okonoko, how important he was, how rich and conflictual his life has been. He's just a footnote in a book that he might write about, you know, 
that title, a lot of times such titles were used, the pacification of the Zulu, right? And that gives us the worldview that things have fallen apart. These people have come out, right? But their view of this great man of this tribe is pretty much the same as Conrad's would have been when he's dealing with people in Congo, with African people in Congo. So that's Achebe making his point. This is how we figured in your accounts, right? As a problem to be solved or as a small note of how a man hanged himself, right? But to us, after we have read the novel, we, we have not just learned about Okonoko, we have learned about his struggles, his temper, the way he treats his wives. He is this tormented man, right? Capable of kindness, but also capable of great violences, right? That richness is totally wiped out, right? So that's where I usually end the discussion of the novel in my classes with that complexity attached to the story. Why is it that Achebe ends the novel with the impressions of Okonoko's death in the mind of the British commissioner, right? Okay. Let's go to the questions. I do have a question. What does the woman who take away Okonoko's daughter one night denote? Uh, OK, uh, th there is a whole recorded lecture on it if you follow the videos. But part of it, what it denotes is the power of the religion. OK, she is the spokesperson for the gods. OK, she's a normal woman in her real life. But when she takes upon the persona of, of Akbala, right, of the spokesperson of the gods, she can come to your house. She has the power and says, gods want me to bring your daughter to them, to the cave, right? And Okonoko, despite being a warrior and his wife, cannot refuse that. So, so the woman takes their daughter. They can't stop her. But what do they do, right? Her mother follows her throughout the night, wherever the priestess goes, all the way to the cave mouth. But what else do we learn? Okonoko loves his daughter too, right? So he had been going to the cave mouth whole night long, two or three times, and finally goes there and finds his wife there too, and they both wait for the priestess to come out and take their daughter home. So there is deference for the gods and for the spokespersons of the god, but there is also human agency because they decide to follow her, right? And that's what it teaches us, is, is that even that intervention by a religious figure is not absolute, right? They may not be able to stop her, but they use the limited agency that they have to keep track of her. Right? And I think that's what it teaches us. So, Oroko, the church is built in the evil forest. This illustrates Yates' thesis that what was discarded in the evil forest are the ones who bring the end of the organized African culture. Really interesting, yeah. Remember that when, they, when the missionaries asked to build the first church, they are given permission, but they are given land in the evil forest. And so it serves quite a lot of purposes. For the natives of the tribe, that was, OK, they are going to perish over there. For the Christians, it is they, for them to prove that our God is stronger than yours. So on both ends, then, the missionaries get to kind of boast in the strength of their own religion, right? And the natives, on the other hand, like people like Obraika and others, start developing doubts about their own practices, right? Now, remember, uh, the character of Abraika is really interesting because he's a reflective person. And he's already thinking critically about their own religious practices. Like he has questions about why do we have to abandon the orphans, right? Or other things, right? So 
that thought process was already at play. Okay, maybe over a hundred years or more, the you know the religion of the Igbo would have you know become different, would have evolved, right? I hate automatic lights. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. But but think of it this way: uh, the same missionaries who are you know, telling these people that their religion is hedonistic and all. What were their practices a hundred years ago? What were their practices at that time, right? Elsewhere in the world, right? Uh, they were party to an empire, right? This is the same empire which used corporal punishment, which decapitated its enemies. And before that, these are the same people who used to burn witches, right? And and so the, the European church also has its own tragic and cruel history, right? Uh, Oroko, the tragedy is that Okonoko rejects everything his father stands for only to die a defiled death and has to be taken into the evil forest just like his father. I think that is one tragic part of it is that the very culture within which Okonoko wants to define his own masculinity in opposition to his father and where he wants to be this prominent man and goes out of his way to prove that he is strong and he is powerful, right? I think part of the tragedy is that, that by taking his own life within that culture, he absolutely loses any value that he might have accomplished in his lifetime. And that is what also makes the novel more tragic, right? And that is what makes Okonoko into this tragic hero, this tragic character. Good questions. So overall, um, I would recommend, uh, you know, this, I will edit it because there are too many times that I'm trying to turn the lights on. Uh, but now we have a full playlist on things fall apart. So this would be kind of a culminating part of it. But if you go through the playlist, there is a chapter by chapter discussion of the novel, which I've edited and already posted, and then this. But overall, what I would highly recommend is, and you know, Things Fall Apart is not a hard read, you know, is that read it not just from the point of view of what happens to a Conoco, but how does Achebe add cultural knowledge? How does he weave it into the story where it doesn't come across as, as, a, as a side, as a lecture? but it becomes woven into the story. And I think that is one of the brilliant aspects of the novel. Can we not compare things fall apart with Heart of Darkness? Well, yeah, you can. But what kind of a comparison would it be? That will you will have to decide what kind of novels they are, how the Africans are represented in it, how the prose is different. Of course, it is different. They are two different authors. Uh, but a lot of people do the comparison. But comparison in a sense in which things fall apart is considered a response novel, right? A response novel that intentionally goes and says, here is how Conrad represented Africa. And here is how I'm going to tell the story of Africa in which Africans are living, breathing, fully realized characters. That was the intention of the novel. Now, if you are familiar with Achebe's non-fictional work, I have a video on it too. Uh, Achebe did speak on this topic and then published that speech where he indicts Conrad for his, his latent and manifest racism in Heart of Darkness. So you could absolutely read it in comparison to Heart of Darkness. Good question. 
Do we have any other novels that can be defined as writing back? Uh, I don't know if they are full novels, but uh, I would say like if you read uh, Midnight's Children, it is sort of a writing back to Forrester's A Passage to India because it's a story from within. Uh, I can't name any other text off the cuff, but any novel that you read from Africa or Asia, right? Um, that picks up a trope that was a major trope in European storytelling about Asia or Africa, and then unpacks the story from within through native characters will be sort of a right back tradition. Uh, a lot of people, and I had done a webinar on uh, Tayyib Saleh's season of migration to the North. People consider that also as a response novel to the novel uh, novels of Africa. And I'm slightly skeptical of that because what I also want the post-colonial authors to have is this honor and privilege of coming up with their own stories. Not all stories are about colonialism or ignited or initiated by the colonial experience. But that one also, season of migration to the North falls into that kind of category. Okay, Sahar Rahman, if a Kwanako is an African hero, do we have to take into account African poetics? I wouldn't call him an African hero. As I said, Africa is a huge continent. He's an Igbo hero, right? An Igbo hero from 10 villages of the Igbo land, right? Now, I don't know what do you mean by African poetics, right? But obviously those poetics are already part of the novel. I mean, the way the culture makes sense of itself, the use of metaphor, the use of, of proverbs, they are all part of the oral tradition of Igbo culture. So if you want to be um, do study on those proverbs, and there are many studies on those already, then you'll be using a certain kind of tribal poetics. But on the whole, I don't even know what African poetics would be. Uh, and if if it has been defined by someone, um, I, I, I haven't encountered like a specific book that says this is African poetics. Okay. So Enrique, Enrique, I, I don't know your full question. Is there another part to it? Uh, what I am trying to suggest here is, and Sahar, I understand that question. This comes very prominently in people uh, who do decolonial studies. Um, I am a big fan of Walter Manvolo, and I know decoloniality is big these days in Pakistan. But I am not into any kind of pure poetics. Uh, I would never say, let's do Indian poetics or let's do Pakistani. I, I don't understand what that means. Because I believe that we take the knowledge wherever it is, exists. If the Western way of looking at things is dominant, complicated, insert your own mythologies in it, this is a great example of it, right? This is a novel written in English, but when you read it, this is a different kind of English. So my point always is, whatever you define as your poetics, part of it is what do you expect of language? How is it enriched? What are the figurative aspects of it? How does Achebe do it? How does he Africanize it by using purely Igbo illusions by adding proverbs there that don't come from France or England. And, and so that creates a different kind of hybrid poetics. But I am not into any form of purist, nativist ways of looking at literature and life. Um, good, yeah, yeah, so Silko's the Almanac of the Dead is writing back in the good. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And there are quite a few others I can't like remember at this point coming from also Native American authors. Yeah. 
would you consider Oconoco's strategy similar to that of, yeah, I mean, I have never consciously made that connection, but yes, you could argue that, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I would rather read Okonoko in his own right as, as a character, right, written by Achebe in a novel, in a highly successful novel, right? Sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, here is a good question. Don't you think it's the very culture of Africa, the way it is presented in the first part of the novel that is kind of invitation to the colonial authority to come? Um, not necessarily. I mean, what would be an invitation to colonial authority to come that, that these people are doing these things, they've been doing it for a thousand years, so let's go and correct them? No. I mean, colonial authority came to Africa and India looking for resources, right? Looking for plunder first, if you go to pre-capitalistic colonialism of the Spaniards and the Portuguese in the Americas, they were looking for gold, right? And for the Europeans in 19th and 20th century, capitalism was rising, they needed raw materials. So they went to other places in the world to conquer them. Now, in order to conquer them, in order to mobilize resources and sell the idea to their own people, yeah, they used, it, they used legitimizing strategies. Religion was one of them. We are going to Christianize these heathens. And civilizational mission was the secular one. We are going to bring light and civilization to these people. How do you do that? You then point out, look what they do. They do this, do they do did they do that, right? And we're going to eliminate them. We are going to bring Christianity to them. I never deny the fact that missionaries could have been sincere, but they were also part of the project of empire. So the only thing that makes them an ideal target for colonizers maybe is their internecine warfare, their military weaknesses. But part of the reason the Europeans are there is because they need those resources. Right uh, now, do they become sincere in developing some infrastructure here and there? Yeah, maybe, but it wasn't an altruistic project. Right, anyone who says that has not read his or her history. Right, uh, one more question I have seen patterns in African literature telling story of a tortoise, and in this book, also, yeah, I mean, uh, it. I, I can promise you that they would be particular to the Igbo culture, but they could also be widespread. So what do these stories tell us? These are wisdom tales, right? So the European cultures go back to their folk tales for that. Uh, in, in Persia, we, we go back to the Persian folk tales. In, in Pakistan, we go back to, you know, Pakistan just imagines only like life up to Islam. So they go to Islamic folk tales. You know, how did so and so treat who was Hatam Thai and he was like the most um, generous man in the planet. So every culture uses those. Uh, so these stories that are told over here, these are wisdom to tales told by mothers to their children, right? Derided by men as women's stories, but they are also stories that give them a sense of right and wrong. And you can depending on where a novel is set in Africa, if it is you know, set in Nigeria, in Igbo land, the stories may be similar from one tribe to another, right? But I'm very reluctant to call everything African, right? I mean, Africa is a continent, right? Um, it has thousands upon thousands of different cultures, religions, cultural traditions, languages. So I'm very reluctant to conflate entire Africa into African literature. Right? Um, so this is a good question. What is Africanization in social cultural context? If certain values, what are those? Um, I have not read anything about Africanization. Now, it comes across in Chin Weizu's work 
uh, but that is more complex than just going and retrieving African heritage and African history. What Chen Weizhou suggests is uh, in decolonizing the African mind is to, to jettison all of European influences, the Arab and Islamic influences, and then retrieving historically African culture, values, artific effects, ways of looking at life, but do that in modernity so that you're part of the industrial capital, right? But not necessarily imagine a pre-modern past and try to shape African life accordingly. So that would be for me like a theoretical engagement with Africanization of African cultures, right? But I recommend that you should read uh, Shin Weizhou's Decolonizing the African Mind. And even Chen Weizhou is not a cultural purist. He knows that we exist in the world. He knows we live in modernity. So he would rather... Remember, the thing with African cultures was what made it doubly tragic was that most parts of Africa had oral cultures. Tradition was passed from one generation to another through orator. So if you disrupt that process for one generation and two, the loss is huge, right? Because when you lose your stories, when you lose your culture, you lose your cultural history, you lose your culture. That is why people like Chen Weizhou and Gugi Tiango and even Chinua Achebe insist on producing African literature and African stories because the loss in Africa was greater. First, the Arabs come in, right, in North Africa and West Africa, and then the Europeans come in against a culture that didn't have a written script, right? So that is, is the loss that they are trying to undo, right? And that's why emphasis is on retrieving local stories, collecting them, writing about them, writing in native languages and emphasizing on that. Now, the other people who talked about Africanization were the people from the Negritude movement. That was in the 60s, people like Senor and others. And they were slightly essentialist. They wanted Pan-Africanism, but they assumed a universal African identity. That's why people like um, Fanon and others were opposed to that. Even though Senor famously says that, no, we we are culturalist, we are not essentialists, right? But the idea was slightly essentialist. And so that is all I know about Africanization. So I'm going to kind of conclude here. Overall, then, if you ever read Things Fall Apart or teach it, um, do dwell on the native stories that he incorporates in it. But what is the purpose of those? That as we read Okonoko's story, we are also learning about Igbo practices, Igbo culture, what for the conflicts, how do they mediate those conflicts? What is the relationship of the ancestors, right? Why do you must appease your personal chi, which is your personal God, and the spirits of the ancestors? Because the spirits of the ancestors intercede between you and the gods, right? So what we're dealing with are an intact cosmology of practices and belief systems. It is not perfect, right? In so many cases, it creates, you know, injustice as well, right? All religions do that. There is not even a single religion which, if followed to its letter and spirit, will not create an unjust world, right? So anyone who has made those bought into those mythologies that this religion or that religion will create an equal and caring world. No, religions, because there are boundaries to what you can and cannot do, by their very nature, create an unjust world, right? And so this is the story of one such religious practice and the culture that depends on it, right? And uh, and so that's why this, this is an extremely important novel in world literature, in post-colonial studies. 
and by the way, my views on literature, on religion are my own. You don't have to have those. And my, my idea is not to offend anyone, but just to say that any belief system followed in extreme without a room for change or a different thought will become an oppressive system. Uh, so that's where I'm, um, I'm going to stop and uh, see if we can have any more questions. And what had I agreed to? What were we going to do next week? There was a novel in the beginning. Um, before I forget, could you please remind me? Sorry about that. Uh, what had I agreed to? God of small things. OK, I'll put a note here. God of small things. OK. I'll try to answer. Uh, here is another question not related to um, Abdullah had a question about literature review. Can you do something on literature review? Uh, so my answer to that is always, sorry, I cannot do that. I was not trained to write a literature review. I don't teach my students to write a literature review for their dissertations. We don't do that here, at least. Uh, most of our dissertations are written differently. There's an introduction, and then there are chapters. Uh, this practice in Pakistan, I don't even know how it got started. Um, I think it's because they were following the social science model. And, and I have never written a literature review. So of course, I can't really even talk about it. That's why I never bring it up. Uh, OK, so this is a good question. What is the purpose of including stories? Um, does it propose to show to the local people who forget their culture or show to the Europeans? So I mean, there are two ways of looking at it. First of all, what function do the stories serve within the novel itself? Right? The stories are didactic. The story of the tortoise right? is telling something to the kid. Mother is telling the story. So the stories are didactic. They have a didactic function. They are either cautionary tales or they tell about a certain thing and how to conduct yourself in that. So within the novel, that's their function. Beyond the novel, for a European reader, their function is also didactic, right? Here are the stories we told our children to teach them about fairness, to teach them about truth, just like all the other cultures tell their cautionary tales and stories. I mean, if you look at the Western tradition, where do the Grimm's fairy tales come from? Right? From the German folklore tradition. What were those uncensored fairy tales meant to teach children, instill discipline and fear? Now, in the original Cinderella story, you know, what happens to the other two sisters, right? They lose their feet, right? And they have pangs of pain when they walk, right? So the stories in that context were also cautionary tales, stories told to instill in children certain values and certain things to fear. Uh, and so that's the function of the stories within the novel. And beyond the novel, it creates a cosmos of the local culture. How are values passed on to children by their mothers? That's the function I think the stories serve. If you look at any single story in the novel, it's not simply there, here is a story. It has a function within the story, within the novel itself. Ha, <laughs> Yeah, that is funny. Yeah, the Igbo had to deal with the Konako as well. Yeah. Uh, uh. So Anil Patel, thank you so much for your scholarly videos. Would you please make a few videos on importance and relevance of literary theories in our life? 
actually, I mean, I haven't made one particular video on how theory is important for our lives, but any of the videos on theory or literature that you pick up, uh, that is always what I try to connect my conversations to. What does it mean in real life, knowing something or having a complex way of looking? So I would say if you go through those videos, you will see that that message is interspersed throughout those videos. OK. Um, all right. So before I leave, those of you who have joined us from India, um, uh, stay safe. And I am really, really, really sorry for what is happening over there. I hope the world community comes together and, you know, comes together to help India and the people, because this is something that India shouldn't have to deal with alone, right? It's a global pandemic, but I've been watching the news and my you know, prayers and best wishes are with everyone in India where the pandemic is you know, taking a huge toll. So I hope you all are staying safe, right? But also if you are able I know you're already doing that, but in this time of need, you know, reach out to the people in your community. The problem with the capitalistic life in which we live is that we get too focused on our own lives. This is the time if you are in the major urban areas of India or even in the rural areas, and if you have the means, right, please reach out to your neighbors and people who might need you. Sometimes it's just a little help, but, uh, you know, I hope things improve soon, right? So my best wishes to all of you. Thank you for uh, joining me. Okay, good. Okay, Hamza, thank you. So, um, yes, so I will make some videos on Foucault, but I can't promise them immediately because for anything of that level, I have to really spend time and reread and prepare and then record something on it. But I'll do something. Um, OK. All right. Uh, OK, so I'm going to sign off. Thank you all so much. And whatever I can retrieve of today's uh, you know, session, I will edit it and make it available. Sorry about the lights and everything. but. Uh, all of you, wherever you are, um, remember, we will be talking about God of Small Things in the next webinar. Thank you for suggesting that. And then stay safe, right? Take care of each other, especially in India. Stay safe. Um, and my prayers and best wishes for all of you there. And as always, thank you so much for joining me. And I will now see you next week, OK? Uh, take care and peace and love. Goodbye.